Great. Thanks, Ali. Um, welcome. Welcome to this uh, fireside chat with uh, one of the latest additions to the ERC movement, uh, Rancho Cacatillas. We have uh, two wonderful presenters from their side with us today, Anne and Florence. And John is here also. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, we are uh, uh, very pleased to have you around the fire. I'm dressed in a suit, which is not usually very suitable for sitting around a fire. Um, uh, but my day has been with suits. Uh, I always call it camouflage. Like a biologist would dress up in greener clothes when they're in the forest. I dress up in suits when I'm amongst in meeting rooms. Anyway, um, enough about my clothes. Uh, let's go straight into this fireside chat. I am going to share my screen. I hope uh, it works. It's the 9th of May, 2023, uh, in the sixth year of the ERC movement uh, being fully up and functioning. And we are uh, about to welcome our 60th community to the ERC movement, which is uh, an incredible growth. And it shows how much there is a need from people who are working on the ground, uh, who are thinking about how to involve local communities, farmers, and uh, those who are most involved in the local ecosystem that they're joining this movement. It's it's very empowering and very, uh, a very positive, gives you a very positive feeling. This particular fireside chat has a standard format. Um, I share some news from the movement. Then um, John will start the actual conversation around uh, what's going on. And then uh, the, the particular ERC who we are featuring will uh, present their work and their ambitions. Um, and this time that's Rancho Cacachilas. Uh, hold your questions until after the presentations. It makes it uh, more comfortable to tell your story and maybe the question will be answered. After that, you may ask your question in person by raising your hand. Uh, I'm okay with you putting it in the chat also, but I will give you the floor to then ask that question. And there will be plenty of space for conversation, for questions, for uh, philosophizing, because the session will last one hour, uh, but we usually don't shut down the, the Zoom because the conversations are still ongoing. Feel free to stay for an open discussion. And sometimes completely different themes pop up also that can be discussed around the fire. Uh, the fire, if you put it visually in your mind, it helps. We're sitting, we've worked our heart, we've worked hard all day in restoring. Uh, it's getting darker. We're about to eat something and we've lit a fire and we're sitting around it. And uh, we're curious about each other. We're curious about what the others are thinking. We're patting each other on the back. And uh, yeah, we'll see what happens when you're sitting around the fire with the conversation. Before we, uh, before we do this, I'd like to share a bit more about what's going on uh, currently uh, in the movement and especially the things you can find, uh, the, particip the participatory exercises you can join in at some of the ERCs around the world. Um, this weekend, if you're in the Netherlands, there's the Boot Biodiversiteits Festival, uh, co-organized by the Dutch ERC called King's Garden. Uh, it's a festival with music, uh, learning workshops uh, around biodiversity uh, in agriculture. Uh, then in May, the French uh, ERC is organizing another body, heart and soil immersive regenerative experience with uh, people that have done these find very, very enlightening and very regenerative. So I uh, definitely would recommend you looking into going to France at the end of this month or in the middle of this month. Then in the beginning of June, uh, there is a course that you can take about ecosystem restoration at the ERC Atiplano in Spain. Uh, another course in uh, July, very hot then, but still worthwhile going. And then another course after the summer in September that they're inviting you to. And uh, yeah, uh, consider going there. I call this slide participate and learn. We have launched a new website and there is more to discover. 
uh, of what you could participate while you're uh, going there. If you go to ERC Earth or Ecosystem Restoration Communities.org or Ecosystem Restoration Camps.org, they'll lead you to our new website. And if you click on the participate menu, participate menu, you'll get to see those organized events that you usually have to pay for to participate in. But you can also see uh, volunteer opportunities. I, had, I don't have that on my screen right now, but there is a few hundred uh, volunteering opportunities at ERCs around the world. You don't have to pay for those to participate. Uh, you just give your time and your expertise or your skills. And then there are some long-term volunteering opportunities at specific ERCs around the world that you can also find through that new, we call it the Restoration Project Finder. For those who want to participate in these, um, uh, 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 in the work of these ERCs, you can probably find something that matches your needs, your skills, and your interests through that website. So do visit it, uh, see what's on there, and see if there's anything that matches your desires. ERC News, we have a new website, and the reason we have a new website, and you can also see it in the logo behind me, is because we've changed our name. Uh, and we're now calling our movement Ecosystem Restoration Communities. You can also call it Ecosystem Restoration Camps still, or Ecosystem Restoration Camps and Communities. But uh, in the conversation with the ERCs that are part of the movement, we've learned that um, communities just better fits better reflects the nature of these ERCs in the movement, which are usually very much local community based, local farmer based, but very happy to have people from around the world to come and join in the work. There is a new website attached to it. Uh, the old website was very much about uh, what we as a foundation are doing and the movement was almost secondary. This is all about the movement. You can uh, learn more about the movement on it. You can also find out what you can learn. There's courses being offered around the world. You can participate in the work of these ERCs and you can donate to the movement as a whole, but you can also donate directly to the ERC of your choice by finding their page on the website, clicking on the donate button that's on their page and donating directly to them. Uh, and we promise to make sure they get that money as soon as possible. So go and find erc.earth. We're using that one, which is an abbreviation. Uh, and you know, there's lots of abbreviations out there, but it's easiest to remember the ecosystem restoration communities.org website. It, it links to where you can find all these new developments. Two new ERCs are joining the ERC movement in the next few weeks. One is in South Dakota. It's the Bison People Land Group. It's a Lakota Sioux. Uh, initiative to work with bison to regenerate regenerate the South Dakota uh, steps, I think, or the, the grasslands that are there. Um, very exciting because it's a native-led uh, initiative in in the U.S. And um, the people behind it aren't new, but the ERC is new. EcoCamp Treetop in California. It is. Uh, uh, organized by Matthew Trum, who uh, started our third ERC in the movement, which is uh, the Eco Camp at Paradise in California, which is very near to where this treetop ERC is being initiated. And it focuses very much on fire resilience and fire restoration after the uh, incredibly disastrous fires that hit that region. Um, I put a YouTube link in this presentation. I realize it's impossible to copy and paste, but I will put it in the chat. It's a new promo film. It's very much intended for audiences in what we would call the West, where our donor community lives most, uh, and where people are struggling to find out how in Earth we're going to change the direction of society, uh, struggling with governments and corporations and large farming, agribusiness, not changing very much. And I haven't discovered this yet that there's this global movement of people who are making that change already with their hands and their minds and uh, collaborating. Uh, and this new promo has been developed specifically for that group of people. Uh, go see it. I hope it moves you. It moves me every time I see it. I find it very well done. And congratulations on the team to doing that because we're improvising everything. There's very little budget to do this work with. Um, and I do not know why my PowerPoint is no longer. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. 
Can you still see the PowerPoint or are you not watching my? Uh... Go away. There we go. So uh, a final, uh, finally, an invite from me to help us grow this movement. Um, if there's great initiatives you know about that you join, have them join. There is an up and running knowledge exchange platform. There's all the work we do as a, as a community to help each other. And the, the, the presentation of Florent and Anne will be about this. Uh, but we also still need donations uh, because it's not coming in very easily. So if you have friends who you know are loaded, tell them about us. We are the one global initiative that's truly locally focused, truly locally set up, locally led uh, on ecosystem restoration. Uh, and we need, we need that support. Uh, our theory is that if we have hundreds of these initiatives join the movement, we can truly and long lastingly change the face of this planet and change the way humans interact with nature to a sustainable route, a sustainable path. Um, so yeah, tell us, tell the world about us. I am going to stop with my presentation and uh, hand over to John for some wise introductory words, John. Well, um, thank you, Peter. And thanks for everybody who's coming and everyone will hear this later on. Um, personally, uh, I'm really happy that the movement is growing and it, it really needs to because we, we live in interesting times. This is a, a Chinese uh, kind of a concept and it, it's not a good thing. You you want to you want to go to the garden and look at the moon and drink some heated rice wine and write poetry. But if you live in interesting times, you're forced to do other things, and we're forced to realize that uh, humanity has been making a lot of mistakes for a very long time. And we're now we're we're now seeing the results. So there is definitely cause and effect. And hu human civilization has kind of reversed evolutionary succession. So what I noticed when I was studying ecology is that there's always more biodiversity always more biomass and always more accumulated organic matter. And that this is the basis of the creation of the oxygenated atmosphere, the freshwater system, the fertile soils. And over historical time, human beings have turned that around and there's always less biodiversity, always less biomass, always less accumulated organic and this has led to the deregulation of the hydro hydrological cycle, the weather, the climate, the reduction in, in uh, fertility in the soil. And we are there. And no amount of container ships going back and forth across the world with stuff in them is going to change that. The only thing that's going to change that is if human beings actually change their consciousness and understanding of what's important and what is the basis of life. So it is very, very uh, satisfying to see that people are joining the movement, that camps are joining the movement. And I would say something you don't have to know people who have loads of money. We need to have loads of people. So if everybody gives $5 or $10 a month to the Ecosystem Restoration Camps Foundation, we could go to very large numbers of, of members. And in, in the current world, that's a cup of coffee or two cups of coffee a month to share with this movement. And if we got a million people to share 10 
$10 a month, we would have $120 million per year to share with camps. Now, this is completely different than grant writing or, or uh, writing proposals. And we have the opportunity then to be led by the people. And I think we should all realize that everyone is equal, that we're, what we're looking for is a horizontal social organization, not a vertical system. And that everyone, if we all have the ability to work together to collaborate, we're not in competition with one another, we're, we're working together. And that is what makes it possible for us to do amazing things. So as individuals, we're very limited. But if we all work together, we can do things which are quite amazing. And somehow over time, we've been socialized to kind of compete with one another. And we need to realize that no one will remember that, that that's not important. It's what we understand and what we do that's reflected in how the ecosystems function that, that will determine the quality of life for all living things in the future. There's a couple of other things that are happening, which I'd like to just advise, uh, let you know about. One is that the UN decade for ecosystem restoration is getting <clears throat> a bit more functional. <clears throat> and um, there is a youth task force working on food. And I think if we can tell and work with the young people so that they understand that there is a way for them to directly today, tomorrow and every day work, which is more effective at actually infiltrating water or, or mitigating human impacts on climate change or just restoring community, restoring us to, to a place where humanity is in a better place. I, I don't know if in America, it's just unbelievable what's going on with these mass shootings. So I can't, I, I'm traumatized every day, whenever I turn on the news or open the paper, it's just horrible. So one thing is the UN decade, that's, that's happening and we're gonna have many more chances to engage large numbers of young people and the young people will be leading this. The second thing is, I, I've mentioned this a few times, uh, I've been working with a group called Ecoflix I don't know if you've seen Ecoflix, but it's ecoflix.com, ecoflix.com. And what's interesting about Ecoflix is they will give, they, they have a large number of films, mainly on animals, but they have been now putting on something called the great work of our time, uh, healing the earth. And What's interesting about this is that they will give free educational subscriptions to teachers in schools. So if we as activists go to our schools and our teachers everywhere around the world and we say, you should get a Ecoflix free educational subscription, then children all over the world could learn about these issues when they're young. They don't have to wait till they're older. They can see it. And some of the places in the developing world, they don't have many educational resources. So this could really be important for them. So those are the things that I've been thinking about. And I think we, we need to work on just, we've changed the name to communities. We need to understand what it means to be in community. We need to all kind of take that to heart. That we, we are part of a whole, we're not just individuals. So that's what I'm working on and thinking about, and we're gonna have a great presentation now and uh, a, a new camp, a very large and interesting 
collaboration. So I'm very happy to learn more and I'm sure you will be too. So welcome again and thanks for listening to me. I hope you enjoy this and, and <clears throat> I'll stay as long as I can. I do have another meeting later today, but, but I'll stay as long as possible after the presentations to talk with anybody who's interested. Thanks, John. Um, thanks for the, the introductory remarks and the, the spirit and the, the what do you call it, the, the charge, I guess, you, or the impulse that you just gave. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Anne and Florence. Uh, Anne starts uh, from Raj Kakachilis. I'm not going to introduce you any further because I've seen your presentation and you will explain perfectly well what you're doing and who you are. So, Anne, I give uh, the group to you. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Florent from Rancho de Gachilas. I'm just uploading my presentation. Can everybody see? See? Okay. Well, um, we're very excited to be here. Uh, and like um, John was mentioning, starting this, this community and also we always um, hear bad news everywhere. So when uh, I started to be in ecosystem restoration communities, it's good to hear some good news on restoration. And also we're doing this with Anne from Innovaciones Alumbra. Hi, everyone. I'm Anne McEnany. I'm a senior program officer at Alumbra Innovations Foundation, and we are a collective of businesses and nonprofits that's working toward a world in which community, environment, and economy function as an integrated system for well-being. We have a high risk tolerance. We're always learning. We try to think as holistically as we can, and we have a long-term commitment to the projects that we work on. I'm working on, with the team from Rancho Cacachilas on the land and water stewardship strategy for our collective. And Rancho Cacachilas really is the crown jewel of where we demonstrate what's possible. It's where we test, it's where we invest, it's where we innovate, and it's where we invite others. Um, and eventually we hope to influence, to forge connections, to build community awareness, and to, as John says, to equip the learners, workers, and leaders of tomorrow with the, the care and the passion that we have for the land. We really consider Rancho Cacachilas a hope spot in the world, and we're proud of what we've done, but we're here to learn. And that's, we want to thank you all for inviting us and for allowing us a, a seat at the table to share what we know, but also to allow us to ask questions and, and learn from everything that you're doing around the world. So Rancho Cacachilas is in Mexico in the Californian Peninsula at their very tip in the Cape region. Um, I would like to mention that it's a uh, very arid landscape. We the rains that we get it's around two hundred to two hundred and fifty millimeters per year. Uh, normally it's with the monsoons uh, from August to October. This has changed over time. Before we got rains, well, when you talk to elders, fifty years ago they would say that rains would start in June, but now rains are more scarce. And the rainy season is every time a little bit smaller. And also one of the things to say is that because of this aridity, uh, the human footprint uh, is very small. Uh, there's not a lot of people around here. In the whole state, there's around 1 million people. So it's not a very dense state. And uh, going down zooming in into Rancho Cacachilas. What Rancho Cacachilas is this polygon. Um, and we've been adding other polygons, as you can see around here, all, all of these two. Um, in total, there's around 16,000 hectares that in some day we will have to manage. 
for the moment, the ones that we have been managing are the ones that are in green. The green is the fences, uh, and it's about 50% of the total land that is being under conservation. So after 10 years of conservation, we can see the differences like in the wild populations. Uh, like 10 years ago, we could see these groups of deer in the um, summertime when everything's dry and animals uh, gather into the springs. 10 years ago, maximum groups were three deers. Now we see groups of six, seven deers, and sometimes we see males too in there. So these are some of the regeneration programs. There's a lot of programs going on in Rancho Cacachilas. It's a tourism ranch. It's part of the, of the profit, but we're uh, working with the foundation with them to so Rancho Cacachilas can be a farm school where people can learn of these practices and start uh, replicating them outside of our boundaries. So one of the things is a, a fencing program. Then there's the watershed management, the holistic livestock management, and then there's a regenerative agriculture. So as you can see here, the fence effects uh, on the right side is inside of Rancho Cacachila, as you can see much more vegetation. This was fenced out like in 2020. So the changes can be very fast once you protect it. Uh, and we started uh, fencing because normally here, uh, ranchers have their cattle roaming around freely. So once animals are roaming freely, they go to where there's better vegetation, the more forage, uh, so to the point that they overgraze, they compact, and at the end, they desertify. So we start to have more bare ground coming in. So this is a zoom in. Uh, to the ground. As you can see on the outside, uh, there is a lot of bare ground in the back. And also when you can see like directly to the soil, there's barely uh, vegetation covering it. And on the right side, uh, you can see how the annual grasses are coming in and how they are weaving all the leaves that are drying from the um, from other bushes that are around. This is a NDVI picture image of one of our sites, one of the ranches. It's called the Ancon Ranch. If you can see here inside uh, Ancon, this has been uh, protected for more than 12 years. And this is the outside uh, that now is protected for two years. But just as we compared, like the um, the reddish, uh, yellowish are the, it's more bare ground. And the greens, the dense green is dense vegetation. So you can see the, comp uh, as, as, uh, as a sky image, how it, it can change. And also one of the things that I wanted to point it out is the percentage of organic matter. Like inside of the 10 year fencing, there's 1.45, percent of organic matter and outside it's 0.89. It may seem a little bit, but if you do the math, normally 1% of organic matter in the soil can hold 150,000 liters in one hectare. So just here inside, it would be around 80,000 liters of the soil to retain uh, more water for every hectare. It, it, it starts to more to act more as a sponge. On the watershed management, um, it's what we do is different kinds of gabions. Uh, the kinds of gabions we do is according to the sites from the slopes and also into the small creeks and the arroyos that we call. Um, so on the slopes, we use a lot of small branch bundles uh, to retain water on the sides and also these youth bags 
that are uh, filled up with sand and a small mix of cement. And down into the arroyos, we use a little bit more of rocks that are available around there. And in the bigger arroyos, we use rock and cement dams. So I just wanna give a small example of one place that we fenced for four years and erosion kept going on. But once we started with these small branch bundles and these youth bags, one year after, well, after the rains, a lot of annual um, grasses and annual plants started to come in. This is the gabions after the rainy season. You can see how much uh, soil is being retained here. And also we have an example on the ranch of a, a, a kind of stairway of gabions going up the arroyo. And now after eight months of after the rains, it still has water running where other canyons that we haven't worked are drying out. Um, the holistic livestock management is another way we, we try to regenerate the land. We started that in 2014. Um, with 42 criollo cattle. Um, I highlight the criollo cattle because it's genetically adapted to, to the region. The Spaniards brought them 400 years ago and they let them wild into this land. So the ones that are alive right now are, have passed through natural selection where they have resisted a lot of heat, the landscape, uh, the lack of forage in summer, and a lot of parasites. So it's a very, very adapted uh, genetics for the region, and they're very good at foraging. So we've, when we started, we would move them with vaqueros, that's the local cowboys, and with movable corrals. And once the herd started growing, we finally established electric fences. That's much more helpful for this kind of land. And we do big, very big paddocks instead of small ones that normally are, uh, we've seen in other examples in the savory methods. Also uh, last year, we started with the holistic pig management. Uh, we did some genetic studies on them. And it uh, resulted that 87% of our genetics is also criollo. So we, we are starting to this program to, to save the genetics of the criollos. And also we are trying to finalize them in the rainy season when we have all of these wild plums. So the idea is a little bit doing these added value products like brochuto style hams and all of those things. Uh, one of the things, other things we are doing is regenerative agriculture. It's agroecological practices where we have polycultures with more than 30 species. Uh, we don't till the land, there's crop rotations. And also in summer when it's there's a lot of heat, uh, and a lot of the we there's a lot of plants that we can't grow, but we can grow forages, and those forages are organic forages uh, that we use for our goats and cows. We also use compost and biofertilizers, and we uh, we do all of them, and also the organic pesticides, mm -hmm. and also we're creating the seed bank for the region where we are every year selecting the best um, plants that we have. So every time we have more genetically adapted seeds to this region. And one of the things that we do also is the educational programs. So as economic alternatives for the region, uh, we have some beekeeping workshops, uh, cheese workshops, uh, the cheeses that we make are much more higher quality. And also they give at least four times more value. 
to the cheeses than the cheeses that are done around here. And also one of the things that is coming soon is a, is a butcher workshop. So also it's added value to the, to the region. As John mentioned, um, we need to pay attention to the youth around us and make sure that they're connecting with the landscape so that mm -hmm. this land has a future. Uh, we call it a STEAM program, which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And both our ranch teams, as well as visiting scientists, work with kids every week to showcase what we're learning, um, to take them to different places and show them how the land is changing and regenerating, and also giving them access to things like drones, and binoculars and how science happens on the ground. Um, I naturalist. And these are the kids in the rural areas that um, because we live in a ranch culture that is aging, um, most of the, the kids have had to go down to town to, to earn money and to bring back to the family. But the kids are spending more and more time on the landscape and we're seeing a lot of enthusiasm for the future generations creating more of a, to continue the ranch culture and also, but with, we're hoping more regenerative practices. And we're trying to think really big. Um, as I said at the beginning, we really feel like this area is a hope spot for our region. As you can see in the middle of this photo, uh, there's a lot of uh, barren landscape at the top of our watershed with highly overgrazed and ex excessive drought impacts. Um, it's those are the places that we want to focus on that are outside of our ranch boundaries. That is the property. Um, those are many, many owners, and this is a very ambitious vision, but that's the role of the foundation is to reach those families, um, introduce them to new practices and to help provide technical assistance from our ranch teams and other groups working in the area to basically restore this beautiful landscape. Um, to the left here, that boundary is a hard boundary, which is the a biosphere reserve that is the water source for the entire region. And if we didn't say it before, one of our major goals from the foundation is to recharge these aquifers. We need to be building water back into our system, which is allowing the land to naturally regenerate. We're not able to, because we live in such an arid landscape, we are not able to plant trees. Uh, they won't survive. We need to allow the land to tell us where regeneration will happen. And uh, we've been trying to be very thoughtful and methodical about how we move forward. And uh, we're, we're incredibly um, passionate and we wanna move fast, but we wanna make sure we're listening to the land at the same time. And also now that we're in this movement of ecosystem restoration communities and uh, there's several people around here that have experience in doing this restoration on a large scale. Well, we are asking for help to see how we can make this 30 year goal, 20 year goal or 15 year goal so we can accelerate this regeneration in this landscape. Well, and I should also say that this is where we hope to encourage the ecosystem restoration communities down the road. We haven't opened this project to volunteers yet, but we are very hopeful to have more hands working on this vision with us in the future. Yes, the idea is opening to restores for 2024. Right now, 2023 is more the knowledge exchange and how we can start this camp in Rancho Cacachilas. So that was the regeneration we do on Rancho Cacachilas. And also we wanted to talk about uh, how we are suffering climate change here in, in our region. 
as I mentioned earlier, our rains are the rainy season is every time a little bit smaller. And in 2020, we had an exceptional drought. It was the driest year over the 70 years. And after that, we had two good rains. So that had, uh, we think, had a possible trigger stress on a lot of, in the ecosystem. So there was a lot of cactus and trees right now that we are seeing that are sick and some are even dying. Also in that year, in 2020, a lot of cattle died. There was a lot of virus going in the ecosystem. Um, also a lot of deers died and also some hares died. So it was pretty dramatic for that year. So in that, so just to give you an example, in that year, we had a 50 millimeter rain in Rancho Cacachilas, when normally it's 200, 250 millimeters per year. And some parts of the ranch, it didn't even uh, rain. So these, as I said, uh, uh, plants started to stress. So when they stress, uh, their defenses go down. So there's a lot of beetle damage in some trees. And it's. I wanted to point this tree out. This is a Bursera tree. These normally have some chemicals that don't allow beetles to come in. And now there's a lot of beetles attacking a lot of trees. And also there's apical constriction in some of the of the cactus. That's when they they pass through a drought or, or water stress. And also the fungi on some trees uh, is that's, there's more fungi on the trees now. And also we can see a lot of um, cactus that are yellowing, and also some cactus they have like. Uh, gray skin and also the apex where the growth normally goes it's graying out so we've seen that some cactus that have more than 50 to 60 percent of graying that's that inhibits its photosynthesis so some they are most prob they they can die if they there's more gray on their bodies and this is what I wanted to share of Rancho Cacachilas. And did oh. you want to add something? No, we're just really grateful to be part of the network and to learn from you all. And so please, anything you have to contribute in terms of learning from the, the last slides we shared on the drought, we're still trying to determine the root causes, um, although there are, it's probably a multiple, multiple stressor cause, but um, anything that anyone's learning around the world in these same kind of arid regions would be helpful to us. Yeah, um, thanks both. Um, and I think we need to be grateful that you decided to join this community uh, with all the knowledge that you bring and all the insights you already share. And uh, in our conversations in the last few months, uh, I think arid regions have a lot of ERCs in them. And in these arid regions, there's a lot of learning going on, but there's also a lot not, not yet known. Uh, and the search for what will work in restoring arid regions and uh, the search, you know, starting at a smaller scale uh, that's something that we uh, that we're jointly trying to find out, and um, I'm I'm actually looking forward to that conversation starting with uh, Somalia, Turkey, uh, Northern Africa, uh, all the places that are dealing with droughts, droughts and droughts, Southern Africa, uh, and seeing the impacts on vegetation that have always been there, but that are starting to die, and how then to kickstart that. Uh, ecosystem again, and I saw in the comments uh, Jonathan from Hotlam that I visited last week or two weeks ago now. Huh, Jonathan, uh, huge fire uh, has changed the forest landscape into a desert landscape, uh, and uh, there's some major challenges there too. So I think 
from around the world who are trying to grapple with this. And I see one of our greatest experts, John, raised his hand because he saw an arid region change, which is why so many of us are in this movement in China. But maybe you have some other insights too, John, that you would like to share. Um, well, yes. First of all, Florent, and, and thank you so much for that presentation. It's so exciting to have you in the communities and to imagine what we can do together around the world. So I think I have a lot of relevant uh, information for you. I'm hopeful that we can have more times to discuss this and find ways to collaborate. But I, I did want to tell you that we've been working on something called the Eco Oasis with Dr. John Todd. And this is, I, I, I wonder you might have, you, you know about the biosphere experiments, or you might know about the Eden project in, in Britain. Well, imagine geodesic domes and understand that if we, if we create geodesic domes, we can actually control many climate uh, parameters within that. And we can use these as incubators. So it's possible to maintain different relative humidities inside the dome. And in doing that, it allows you to create uh, an incubator which could in, in grow soils. We one of the one of the things that has been been working is on early precursors of soils. So diatoms, for instance, are critical for the creation of soil, early succession soils, and it's possible to bloom these rapidly. In, in the eco oasis. So this is something that we could talk about because it's already being developed for Egypt and for other, other arid areas. So I hope we can uh, find a time soon to uh, connect with that. And I'll be, I'll be in Europe relatively soon, staying at the eco oasis for a while. So I'm gonna, try to do some documentation of it and some writing about, about its major characteristics and be, be willing to share that. So my thought. Sorry, I got distracted looking for a video that explains the equal oasis. Uh, and the only one I can find is in Dutch, but um uh yeah that's that's it's a way to start regeneration again when all is lost but i get the feeling from the satellite imagery you showed that not all is lost yet but that some severe drought events are uh, are causing some rapid changes uh and i yeah maybe there's others here who are working uh in dry areas who would like to share some insights um in this call and if not uh you know as i said to you we'll start a a, a design lab on the new ERC knowledge platform to see if we can get some of these people that are doing this on a daily basis also to join up with you guys and uh, have some joint uh, design thinking take place and see if we can uh, across the globe start to figure out some methods to get out of the stronghold of drought. Because what we do see that if you are able to regenerate areas, rain often does return. It's an interesting uh, uh correlation and uh, what i know when we visited the sinai and what we hear from syria right now is that uh, just stop tilling the soil already holds so much more water and i know that you guys are doing that anyway um jonathan has his hand raised and tatiana has her hand raised jonathan hi hi everyone more here in brazil it's almost the uh late time and uh i will uh in our region uh it's very dry uh it used to be very dry before the climate change now it's rainy more than the usual um, and uh the cashew plant, uh, tree it's very good for restoration this kind of area because he likes of dry uh, dry region 
and uh, he is quite produce, uh, productive, productive uh, in, uh, in the dry regions. And uh, now the day that it, uh, it starts uh, running more here in this region, Brazil, where we are, um, the cashew is not so good because he likes the dry. And then we plant the, the trees and between the trees, we can restoration the soil because they protect for the very, uh, the sun and the very erosion and very things that like that. And uh, the cashew is a very, very uh, good for restoration dry season. In Africa and uh, in India, they use it to do this too. It's just to share what we are doing here. Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. I saw your uh, contribution in the chat also. Uh, Jonathan, you've got your laptop turned on. <laughs> yeah, um, I just noticed that Carlos put in a comment on this topic, but I think that what we have to recognize, looking at that graph that was shown, we're having really extreme weather events. It's not just a drought. Here in California, we're having flooding, in fact, this week here in Northern California, we've had two inches of rain or even two or three inches of hail in mid-May, which is our you know, warming spring season um, in, in just a few hours or less. Um, we literally had you know, a, a hail downpour yesterday here. And so I think we have to look at um, ways of introducing kind of broadcast soil amendment. And I had a really interesting suggestion from a registered professional forester yesterday about bringing in pine needles because people are trying to get rid of pine needles in areas where there is fire danger, but introducing them back into an, a region that has lost those pine needles may actually be uh, more conducive to holding the soil from these heavy deluges and then simultaneously, we're not introducing a potential pathogen like wood chips or hay, which would introduce invasive species. So coming up with really creative solutions for your specific ecological region is, is crucial. And so I'm just interested to hear what people are doing to address the extreme differences in um, weather patterns that we're experiencing. The climate change is not like on a linear trajectory. It's up and down. And this is why I think, you know, ideas like John is promoting um, are both good and somewhat troublesome. We don't want to wall ourselves off and have some kind of conservation fortress or have a technological solution that can't be sustained, but looking for local ecological solutions that promote the resilience to these dramatic climate um, differences. Here we're having a really, really cold springs. We're getting snow this May, um, which is not unheard of, but it's definitely more extreme after these droughts that we've experienced for years. So I just like to hear what people are suggesting as kind of um, biological solutions also to their local um, climate catastrophes. Thanks. So before I give it to you, John, uh, Carlos, if you're willing, as I see your uh, contribution in the chat, which talks about also about a more system system based approach using local governments and everything. Could you share a bit more about that? Sorry to put you on the spot. Carlos, no, don't worry, uh, uh, John. Carlos, if you're if you're there, you're muted. If you're interested in speaking now, but if not, um, I would I would just say that uh, in many of the successful restoration projects that I've seen, they took a a, a method to stimulate and and increase the rapidity of 
uh, evolutionary succession. So they were expressing not necessarily always uh, endemic or, or indigenous species, but they were expressing pioneer species that would grow rapidly. And it's interesting in China where, where I, I began to study this, they used really fast growing and non-native species. But now when you go to these areas, you don't really see those. You see a massively diverse higher succession situation, which in many cases return because the, the legacy genome was there dormant, but the conditions were not right. And I think when you're what you're saying, when you say you can't plant trees, I think this is what this suggests. And uh, I found one one uh, agronomist, and I would say scientist, who was working in Kenya. He actually won many awards for his restoration efforts. His name is Rene Holler, if you have a chance. He's quite old at this point. I don't know how his condition is. We, we had helped him 15 years ago to, he had had many masters and PhD students studying with him. And there is a place called Holler Park near Mombasa. He was working for a, a cement factory and the cement factory had completely done this open pit mining to get aggregate for cement through from calcium carbonates, so uplifted coral uh, from ancient coral. And they were just wiping it out. And there was nothing left. There was no vegetation. There was no, and when you do this, the other thing that's very important to understand is when you, what you mentioned with your orange, Coloration, coloration in the in the uh, satellite imagery is that when you expose the soil, the solar radiation directly hits the ground. There, in my experience, the temperature increases are enormous. They're like 15, 20 degrees. That's normal. 10 degrees would be like, you know, you know, not very much. And I've seen as much as 45 degrees differences between below a vegetative canopy and on exposed soils. So when you do this, you're altering the physics. And when you alter the physics, then you're pushing the moisture into the upper atmosphere where it's no longer circulating close to the earth. This is the, the phenomenon. And there's one more aspect that I noticed about this. The water is not simply in the organic material in the soil. So it's not just about infiltration and retention in the organic layer. That's important, very important. And that should be a sponge and it should be moist and, and friable and have a lot of porous areas for the water to go down. But actually the water is in the vegetation. So so the cellular water, it's almost like there's, there's different kinds of water. You know, we talk about gaseous or uh, we talk about liquid or we talk about solid, but actually it's cellular. We are 70% water. So, so the water is in the, in, the, in the living material. And the canopy, the height of the canopy, that's also a critical understanding is when the, the, the higher the canopy, that's where the solar radiation is interrupted and you get this microclimate below the canopy. So the higher the canopy, the larger this, this microclimate is below the canopy and that's where the moisture circulates and the temperatures are, are massively lower. 
So uh, those are those are things. If 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 you could emulate the the evolutionary succession, starting with pioneer species and going further up, you would have a a, a rapid a rapid change actually. And it and the other thing that happens is it reduces the wind speed, changes the wind direction, and lowers vortex activity. So a lot of the extreme weather events that we're talking about are the, the result of these enormous surface temperature changes and the reduction of the density of the air. So that's what it makes me think about when I hear what you're facing. And I think, John, there's a, an important point in what you raised is that um, many restorationists, restorationists feel hesitant about non-endemic species and succession in that sense, uh, still, uh, you know, the fear of invasives. I don't know about you, Florence, how you feel about those. Uh, but they, uh, yeah, we do see evidence everywhere that they speed up that restoration process simply by providing shade to endemic species who otherwise find it difficult to grow. Uh, and indeed uh, help with that hydrological cycle. Jonathan has his hand raised again, but do Florent or Anne want to respond to any of these conversations so far or things suggested in the chat? Yes, I just wanted to add a little bit on on what John was saying, and just to answer a little bit of your invasive species. There's, there's several ones, but like the ones that we worry most about is buffalo grass because of what its history is in the world. Um, it's very, it likes a lot of fire and the species around here didn't evolve with fire. So if mm. we have more buffalo grass, there's going to be more fires and it can be a monoculture of buffalo grass in some point. Um, that That's one of them. And the other one, I don't know, the rubber vine, it, it's a vine that comes from Madagascar, and it's very invasive in the in the arroyos. So, it, like in the where the water, um, where there's more water. So, those are invasive species that we're um, trying to get out of the system before we start. Uh, the revegetation of the area because once we start revegetation and there's more water in the system those are gonna proliferate much more and i just wanted to add what, of what john was saying uh, of the um, the microclimate um before people hear the elders when you um listen to the elders 50 60 years ago Rain started in June and went up to October, and there could be like 30 rain events. And it wasn't like very hard rain. It was more soft rain of what I've heard from them. And now when we have rain, it's in August, sometimes September, and sometimes it's just one event per year. And for me, it's part of that, that there's a lot of bare ground that's pushing the clouds away. And what we want to do with a 30 year goal is start to revegetate the whole system, the whole region to the point that we can bring the clouds back and the rains back as it it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. And it will work. Um, Carlos said that his microphone is working. Uh, and I'll give you the floor after Jonathan because he's had his hand raised for a while and then I'll give it to you, Carlos. Jonathan. Why don't we hear from Carlos first because I'm kind of responding to his comments. Feels very parliamentary. He yields to you, Carlos. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, uh, I just got to say uh, it, it's been quite interesting because we gathered uh, local organizations because of the policy and management uh, awfulness in our city, in Querétaro City. Here is uh, the, um, a city next to Mexico City. 
So it, it, we have dry lands, you know, we, we have a very exacerbated urbanization model. So we were running out of green areas to recharge aquifers and to allow the uh, hydrological cycle to properly function. So we, we started making pressure, 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 because also we got our water privatized by a model of um, pub public private associa uh, association here in, in our city with corrupt uh, government and all kind of Mexican things, you know? So it, it's be, it has been uh, hard but we are still pushing. We we are growing. Uh, we call it a um, uh, collective intelligence uh, with a. Uh, um, I forgot the, the concept, but it, it is about we we are learning and educating uh, about water. So we have lawyers. We uh, I'm I'm an environmental engineer with the watershed management uh, master's study. But we we also have a, a lot of artists and and different different fields of working for water. So we we wish to we 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 are looking forward to to help expand this kind of network in other countries in other places, just like ecosystem restoration communities, to understand and on a deeper level of water from chemistry, from society, social and cultural meanings. So yeah, and we are celebrating about the protection of Peña Colorada because it, it is a micro watershed we, which joins three aquifers, which will allow to recharge uh, the the groundwater from our metropolitan zone. But also there there are a lot of of errors coming like um, aqueducts and uh, a lot of things that we are uh, not happy our government to commit, but we are still pushing. Hey, thanks. Hey, and uh, feel free to join the movement. We are not a competitive organization. It costs the initiatives nothing to be part of us. And only, only the only thing we ask is that you share your insights and your knowledge. Seems like you have quite a few of those. So be very welcome for people in other water stressed areas to hear about your approach. Maybe it can be copied. Jonathan. Yeah, I love this topic. And I also know that it's quite controversial. Those who are initially working on some of these things were even referred to as eco-terrorists when they were trying to relocate plants. You mean invasives or exotics? Yeah. Well, exotics, yeah. Um, maybe yeah. one word. I, I don't like the word invasive. I mean, we're in a, a global ecosystem at some level that you know there's colonization that's been happening for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not longer years, um, and migration. I like the word migration and how do we assist migration. And simultaneously, I think we have to recognize the importance of indigenous peoples and species. So one of the approaches that I'm doing, because I've found out that the state seed bank does not have any seeds in the seed bank from the valley, the region in which I'm in, is I'm looking to collect seeds from trees, from in, in endemic species that have a history of living through these kind of um, environmental conditions from the edges in which the fire did not actually touch. We used to have trees forming a canopy that John mentioned how important the canopy is um, that were, you know, 150 meters high and most of those trees have have died within the fire zone but there are edge trees that i'm discovering as i hike around into the wilderness and looking to try to find ways to um, provide trees from those historic um, genetics the progeny well simultaneously i'm bringing trees from lower and drier elevations up mountain, which is the way that a lot of commercial forestry units are doing. And the federal government is also doing a reforestation project where they're introducing a different kind of pine. So I don't think it's an either or, but an and also. And I think we do have to work on our 
you know, heirloom heritage um, seed banks. And so I think there's, you know, something that we can provide as um, local activists and local, um, you know, uh, whatever we want to call ourselves, restoration experts to try to find those seeds and um, propagate them from species that were endemic to the area prior. And so I'm, I'm approaching this in this way and um, hoping to have some camps that are specific around um, seed collection from um, native species. So that's a thought that I have. Yeah, so uh, Florence and uh, others, um, there's this invasive being pushed on you, or the exotic, uh, but you responded with two that are threatening uh, the health of the ecosystem. Uh, the ones you mentioned, the grass uh, that could introduce fire and the, uh, the vine. Um, but as a way to re-wet the system, uh, how, how, how do you think about that? What, what is your response? as an expert on your ecosystem? Well, as Jonathan says, like uh, invasive is kind of a mean term. I yeah. I understand that. Uh, and also as humans, we are pretty invasive. So um, there, but for us, for me, uh, there's several species that we can use more in like, like in the fruit forests, like where the canyons are, where there's more humidity, what we've been using as that could be possibly invasive, but uh, is a moringa tree. So moringas, um, as you know, are superfoods, and here they grow very good. So for us, it's an alternative for us to, to eat as vitamins, but we use it a lot for our animals that normally in the, in the dry season, we have to supplement. And supplementation here for animals is alfalfa, and it's what you, uh, it comes from the lowlands where there's a lot of exploitation of the aquifer, and it's used with chemicals. So that's something that we're trying to get out of our equation with some other species that's not native. So uh, I'm not against using other species if we can use them in benefit of, of everyone. Um, I, I'm so fascinated with this question. I forgot looking at the time, but the hour has officially ended. And if you feel obliged to stay, you don't have to. We can also start to migrate into any other issue you would like to discuss with this group being here, because it's an interesting group of people. This is sort of how fireside chats evolve. Uh, that's perfectly possible. If you are uh, having to run away, feel free. Uh, we're not offended. Um, that's okay. Uh, but because the official hour has ended, I would like to formally uh, thank you, Florent and Anne, uh, for uh, your contribution, and John, for your contributions, and everyone else who's contributed to this discussion. Uh, if you don't mind, I will end the recording, although I'm sure I'm going to miss some great conversation, so you can persuade me to do differently for people who may want to see this after this, uh, this, this Zoom ends. Maybe we should leave it on. I'm thinking out loud now. Um, I see Ali saying, yes, leave it on. I'll leave it on such influential persons um yeah so feel free to leave but free free also to freely contribute because uh we're in a very good content conversation right now that uh is producing knowledge that might be useful for others who see this later and absolutely feel free to go thank you for being here and uh carlos she's going to chase you <laughs> uh good uh, uh ali Um, hello, uh, I hope Carlos is still here, but I just admit him again, I think, no, Carlos, <laughs> no, uh, because um, I feel 
is very interesting and a project that is involved in water. I'm really worried. Uh, so a brief introduction. I have a Spanish name, I have Colombian, but I'm also half Italian. I grew up in Italy. And one big project regarding water is taking now place in Lake Como because in Italy there has been the worst drought uh, in the past year ever recorded and the glaciers are melting. Um, so even um, places where usually don't face this problem now are facing it. And I think it's really good to connect and maybe in the knowledge exchange, open a conversation about this. But we have last Carlos, so I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm watching the. I'm watching it. I think keep, keep tell us what you want to say. <laughs> no, yeah, um, just that. Like it's so interesting. I mean, the some parts of the world are getting drier and drier, and some others. Christina shared with me a few weeks ago um, an amazing video of uh, the desert in Jordan with uh, grass in April. So. Maybe these are just circles. Um, yeah, but it, it's interesting. I'm really worried about Italy. So I would like to connect everyone that is doing something similar <laughs> uh, <clears throat> together. Yeah, that was yeah. my intervention. Thank Thanks. Um, thank you, Ali. Um, and absolutely, I think we need to figure out some sort of uh, structured dialogue about uh, water stressed areas and strategies. Uh, anyone else would like to contribute something? If not, then we're going to slowly wind down to uh, ending this call. But John, yeah, does want to. Um, I would just say that um, this the situation with extreme and erratic weather events is going to continue for some time. It's not possible for this to, to uh, be corrected quickly. But I think it's interesting to note that the surface temperatures are what's driving wind speed, wind direction, and vortex activity. So I just want to I want to, you know, reinforce that idea that uh, when we understand this, then we start to see that there are microbiologic, biologic issues, but there's also um, physics. So, you know, we need to really be generalists or be holistic about our view of this. So when we're thinking about hydrology, in, in some of the places that I've been and uh, in research institutes and in development projects with UN and World Bank and others, there's some misunderstandings in, in thinking about hydrology. They're not necessarily thinking about the cycling all the time. They're thinking about quantities. Like when I'm, I'm currently in California, and California has been thinking about water more or less as if the river systems and the aquifers and the reservoirs that have been built are, are just storage facilities. And, and we have a big pipe and we just turn it on and take the water. This is a very simplistic view. And it's not understanding the the the, the concept of the cycling of, of the moisture. And then I think the other thing that's really important about this is that it's not simply local impacts that we're having. We're having local impacts, which then release. So if you have, if you have very high surface temperatures, creating thermic drafts and pushing moisture into the upper atmosphere, you're actually now losing that water from the local system. So where is it going? You know, and I think this is, this is the interesting thing now, which is coming up in scientific 
uh, areas is looking at how does this affect the global things we're, we're having in California this year and last year have been dealing with atmospheric rivers. So <laughs> they, were, they were dealing with drought for more than a decade. And then suddenly they're hit with atmospheric rivers. And we saw this in Spain a couple of years ago where there was right on our, our the camp in Altiplano, there was this event called, I don't know what they exactly call it, but it was just this unbelievable cloud formation. And then the cloud formation just dropped all the water in one go. Huge, huge, just whoosh down. It's, I, I've never, I had not actually thought that that was such a thing because what, what we're seeing is we're in the scarcity, we're looking at just achieving critical mass for condensation and precipitation. But in the case that we change the physics on the planet, we're pushing huge amounts of moisture into the upper atmosphere. And there are two aspects about the moisture in the upper atmosphere. One, it's a greenhouse gas. And it's more of a greenhouse gas and, and it's more prevalent than CO2. So it's more effective as a greenhouse gas or more impactful as a greenhouse gas. And it's more, more quantitatively larger than the CO2 in the atmosphere. And secondly, that water is going to come down. And so it's quite interesting. One person I've been working with is um, Professor Mayan Mayan, who was in the Mediterranean. He was the director of the Mediterranean uh, Climate Monitoring Station in Spain for many, many years. He's now quite old, he's in his 80s. But his work is remarkable in that it shows, and he was able to very, very accurately pinpoint where the water would come down. So this, this is something that most people are not getting to this level of granularity in their, in their considerations of these things, but he's been doing that. And there are some institutes, but uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of work to do in this, but I think we, we need to be aware of this and we need to kind of consider, and that's why we have to work locally, but we also have to work simultaneously on a planetary scale, because this is not about a single place. And when we have these kinds of impacts, we're, we're, it's, it's global in impact. Thank you. Thanks. Um, anyone want to contribute to the conversation? Hi, Chris, I see your video turned on. Chris. You may want to unmute yourself, oh, there you go. There we go. Yeah, lovely to hear from everybody again. Uh, inspiring presentation. Um, just wanted to give some voice into the invasive vegetation uh, conversation. Because um, in our situation, we are dealing with well-established 50, 60, 70 year old established lots of mature invasive vegetation and declining diversity. Um, and so I feel like the capacity of organizations and initiatives to monitor and, and manage appropriately in the long term is really important in that decision making as well, uh, at the risk of of initiating something and not seeing it through and then not knowing the, the long-term uh, uh, knock-on effects down the line. So um, I think it's always very contextual to understanding the ecosystem and the project within the ecosystem and looking at those dynamics over time. Uh, so that's my input into into that, uh, a warning uh, to be careful 
and consider it and to make sure you have a deeper understanding. If that's my interpretation, I see Jonathan applauding that. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Anyone well, else want I, to contribute? John. I, I think that uh, what's happening there in, in Baja is really good because they're planning for the, I mean, at least for decades and they have the long-term goal in, in place. Is that that true, Florent? You, you're you're really dedicated to the monitoring and understanding. Yes, yes, it's true. Are are you already working with Restore? It the ETH, the the Technical University in Zurich. No, I haven't heard about them. Okay, well, oh, we'll I will get you in touch. <laughs> yeah, we'll put you yeah. directly in touch. With, Thank with you. Them. I'll 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 send Mick, our team member, who's currently on the shuttle today, a mail because we uh, will help you. will help you get uploaded to the Restore platform. It's a really good platform to monitor what you're doing. Um, your hand still raised, Chris. You want to add some more, or is that an accidental raised hand? <laughs> Struggling with your phone, I think. Um, confidential, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, I think the enthusiasm to contribute is, is going down. It might be because it's late in the evening in some parts of the world, or the day is waiting and the work is waiting. So I think I'm going to close this uh, wonderful session. It is recorded. We will publish it on YouTube. Right, Ali? Uh, so tell your friends to go watch it uh, and learn. And uh, I think John, one of our Big next effort for the advisory council should be a dedicated uh, session with ERCs and water stress and some of the experts in the council to uh, start discussing what we can what we can invent, uh, learn from each other, and uh, do to help each other. Uh, well, let, let me just add something to that. Then um, we have been talking with the um, Buckminster Fuller Institute and also with Common Land Foundation, also potentially with the Presencing Institute and others to, to join in um, design laboratories on a planetary scale. So this could work by directing it toward different projects. Yeah. So whatever project is needing it can just raise their hand and say, focus on us. And then we can gather everyone together and look at that and, and find out different ways to connect and collaborate. Good. Yeah, that is the intent to collaborate and uh, to uh, build a system that can deal with the complexity and that can bring in all those talents. I am going to wish you a very pleasant evening from my perspective, but it might be morning or day in your perspective. And I hope to see you again in a next session with a new uh project that will present itself very likely to come to talk about drought and uh and vegetation cover but uh as we do this the knowledge will grow thank you for participating and see you uh probably next month already thank you the recording will be on youtube so thank you all be well be well bye thank you for thank you, Thank you. Make sure we function. Thank you, everybody. And everyone else.